not me. <laughs> so I'm going to share my story. There I am. <laughs> Hi, baby. <laughs> So, Dosha, Maragots, Marashima A, Ishuia Hets. Hello, relatives. My name is Eagle Woman. My colonized name is Candy Mossett. I'm from North Dakota. I uh, wanted to share a little bit of my personal story with you today because there's a lot of similarities. And I work with this little tiny organization called the Indigenous Environmental Network. I've been running with that mob since like 2007. And uh, this is where I'm from. Anybody ever been there? Oh, hey! Oh, hi! <laughs> right there, smack dab in the middle of Turtle Island, the, the geographic center of North America. So when I came over here to Australia, I was like, yay, I'm going to actually eat the fish and the seafood because I won't eat it there. <laughs> you can't trust it. We're dealing with something called fracking. Anyone ever heard of that? Raise your hand. Yeah. Yeah. It's called the Bakken Shale oil boom, and that's what it looks like. This is where, where it is. Uh, my community is called Fort Berthold, the reservation, what the government called it. And it's right there, smack dab in the middle of that Bakken Shale oil boom. But before we even had that, we had coal, coal-fired power plants, contaminating all the water, contaminating our air. A lot of people around me are, are sick. And I always thought that was pretty normal. I was like, it's normal to know somebody that has cancer. That's just normal. It's normal that every single bit of our over 11,000 miles of rivers, lakes, and streams is totally contaminated with mercury. Like, that was my normal. When I got cancer in college, when I was 20, I had a stage four sarcoma tumor. I was like, oh, it's my turn. But then people were like, that's not normal. Like, we don't. When I went to college or our university, they were like, we don't know anybody. And I thought, what? You don't know anybody that's sick? Where were you from? Well, it was in a reservation community. And then I started <laughs> realizing, like, dang, this stuff is real. When they do these projects, they're doing them in communities of low, low income, people of color communities is where they're citing this stuff because they don't think we can fight back. This fracking, I mean, they go down like 10,000 feet. I don't know what that is in meters, but it's really far down. And they frack, and they're creating all these earthquakes and making everything really messed up. And we started seeing like these oil rigs just popping up all over. This is just driving down a town in my community. My community is probably about 1,500 people, 1,500. <laughs> and um, that's the big one. Like our smallest community probably has about 200 people in it. We start seeing these oil rigs all over. And in North Dakota, we have a lot of fields, wheat, sunflower, canola, corn. Um, we are called the breadbasket of the country. We feed the rest of the country. But instead of having wheat fields, we started seeing signs that say, for lease, industrial zoned for the industry. So these fracking companies came in, and they started fracking the crap out of everything. And then they started spilling into those wheat fields. This is actually the size of a couple of football fields. This happened a couple of years ago with this spill, and nothing grows there still where anywhere where that oil or fracked water touched. We have all these trucks that drive around on all these gravel roads out there, and all these trucks are actually causing some level of pollution, some level of ozone. This is just a road in my community where I drive on every day where it used to just be me and my friends cruising, and now it's semi after semi after semi driving back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Road work ahead because it's just tearing up all the roads, just crumbling it. Yet the money that's coming out of there doesn't go back into the infrastructure to build up those roads once they get crumbled. I don't know where it goes, to tell you the truth. The rich get richer, <laughs> goes into their pockets. And these trucks are wicked. This is a, um, have you ever heard of a cistern where you have to like haul your water? A lot of people in our community have to haul their own water, so they have to go fill up their water tanks. This frack truck was using our own cistern for our houses and going and filling up his truck with fresh water to take to a frack site. Where, you know, they use anywhere from like, probably around six million gallons of water per frack. Each rig can be fracked like 30 times. And then they just dump the fracked water, which they call salt water produced water, that toxic crap, right on the roads. 
They don't even inject it anywhere. Right on the gravel roads. This is by my dad's house. This is a picture of um, my uncle's truck. He was moving my cousin out of there because she wanted to move out of North Dakota. And one of those semi-trucks came and was an, on the wrong side of the road and drove them off the road. And so they wrecked. They were okay. My brother had like scratches on his back and stuff. The truck was pretty jacked up, but they were okay. That's not always the case. In 2008, my friend Cassie was driving on the road and she was coming back from a local town close to us. And uh, she was driving her dad's truck because she felt safe in her dad's truck. But one of those trucks was trying to pass because he was in a hurry and he ran her off the road and it landed on the cab. So Cassie didn't make it, she was 23. And that truck crushed her. Like at her funeral, there was just a picture of her, nothing else. And she's the first person that got killed by the semi-traffic. Since then, there's been 47 more deaths just from the semis taking over. They wreck in the Badlands, which is where I'm from, and there's no other roads. That is the road. So when they wreck and blow up, it creates backup of traffic for miles and miles and miles and miles. When the pipes burst, we don't know about it until something caves in, like this one in 2011, and they tell us in our communities, don't worry about it, we got these sandbags here. And these sandbags here are gonna make it so that the water doesn't get into Lake Sakakawea. Lake Sakakawea is a reservoir. That is the Missouri River. And they tell us that these sandbags are gonna stop all those toxic chemicals from making it to the water. And that we shouldn't worry about the waste because they store the waste in these pits. And these pits keep out the animals because they're covered with fences. So the animals can't get in there. This is what it looks like. I don't know if that flag's gonna stop an animal. It didn't stop me. I was, <laughs> I tried to pull an Aaron Brockovich. I went down in there, you know, I was trying to like, cause there was a dead frog in there. I was gonna go grab it. But then I got scared cause I didn't want to fall in there. <laughs> so, but the pits are all torn up. They're, they're not even like totally lining the ground. And they tell us, don't worry, it's all good. I don't know if you can see this real good, but do you see the color of that? I, my sister took that from our lake, which is where we get our drinking water from. It's not doctored, that's literally the color of the water one mile from the intake plant. And she was swimming in it. And we're like, what is this? So we took it to the North Dakota State Health Department to have it tested and they're like, don't worry about it, it's just a blue green algae bloom. And I was like, okay, I didn't really know what that meant. Well here they're toxic. You're not supposed to be swimming in it because it takes all the oxygen, it's deadly. You're not supposed to be drinking it. And now these are commonplace since fracking started in our communities. Toxic algae blooms. And people are like, oh, it's just an algae bloom now because it's so ingrained in us from the companies telling us that it's okay. The worst thing is that a lot of times with fracking, what they're doing is they're going after natural gas, right? They, they want the natural gas. Well, in North Dakota, they're going after the oil. So the natural gas is just a byproduct. They're not even using it. They're flaring it as a byproduct into the atmosphere. So North Dakota is a really rural place. There's like 700,000 people in the entire state. So these aren't lights from the city. Those are from flaring. Those are fires. Like these are all city lights in the US. This is from the fires, from the flaring. And just to give you a closer look at what it looks like when I'm driving home at night, this is at night, what it looks like when you look anywhere. It's like a war zone. You can stand there and do a 360 and you just see fire, 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 fire all around you. And we're breathing it in. Every single day since 2006, they have been flaring in my community. Natural gas going into the air. So now we're at ethane and um, methane, methane hotspot of the world. Babies are getting asthmas, RSV, six months old going into the hospitals because they can't breathe. So like five years ago, you could look out at this and it was crystal clear. 
And now you look out at this, my home there, that's what it looks like. They're like, oh, don't worry about it. It's just, you know, natural stuff in the atmosphere. I'm like, well, if it's natural, it's just become natural in the last five years then because it wasn't there before. They tell us not to worry about it. But if you look, just look at the red arrows because the red arrows are showing these components, the chemicals that they use in fracking. All the red ones are carcinogenic. Who knows what carcinogenic means? What is it? Cancer causing. Don't worry about it. It's just these ones that we're using that are cancer causing in your community. And they get away with it. These are paper places where, like my grandma used to go fast here. She would go up on the hill and fast for four days here. And now there's signs that say authorized personnel only. You can't enter. We have, these are the bad ones. Whenever you see these, these are the frack ones that are carrying all the chemicals, the big blue ones. That's a water tower right there. And they don't care where they put these things at all. Because this site is just over the hill from the cemetery where I was burying my grandmother that day. To us, it's a sacred site where we bury our people. And that's right where, where I was taking a picture of the frack field. Because they just don't care. And they're like, we're going to create jobs for you in North Dakota. You should be happy. You're going to get all these jobs. And your unemployment rate is going to go down. And they're like, hey, North Dakota's unemployment rate is like 4% now. And I was like, OK. So I went back and I looked in the records from before the oil industry and fracking. And the unemployment rate was like 4%. And yet we got this influx of like 10,000 people, 11,000 people, and we increased our jobs by like 10,000, 11,000 jobs. It was all people coming out and building man camps, is what we call them, because it's mostly men. To just live wherever, in these trailers, RVs, wherever they can live, they came by the thousands to our communities. Like little communities sometimes just popping up all over the place. And when the man camps came, really bad stuff started happening. Literally, people started getting murdered in the communities. And this is just headlines that I took from the local newspapers. Every single one of these is a headline from a certain day in the Bakken that I just took right off. Can you imagine two streets up from where my mom lives, because there are six streets in my community, a man came in with a gun and started shooting everybody? including the little kids and the grandma that was watching them. One of them lived because his brother jumped on top of him, died on top of him, and the little one just stayed there and didn't move. That little one lived. It's like stuff you see in a movie, you can't make it up. When the man caps came, all those drugs came. We never had heroin in my community before. But when there's money and when there's people, heroin comes. And people like Ashley here got addicted and everybody just said, oh, you're just a drug addict. And there was no services to help her. So when she was 26, she died. And she laid in the hospital for three days while her hands turned black and her feet turned black. And everything started shutting down. And Lisa had f five kids, five kids. And she got addicted to heroin and nobody cared. And there was no services. Oh, you're just a drug addict. Even though it's because of the oil industry and it's because of the man camps. I had a cousin that went missing, Daniel, and he was with two known people of MS-13. MS-13 is a really scary gang that started a long time ago in Venezuela. They're really highly organized crime in my community. They don't try to hide it because they have the tattoos. He disappeared in November. He was with two known people of MS-13. And they said, oh, he's fine. He'll turn up somewhere. Nothing happened. We had to do these searches for him, searching in the winter searching under the snow, and we found Daniel. 
We found Daniel the next spring in the lake. He had been underwater for so long that we had to use dental records to identify him. But because there was no stab wounds and because there was no gunshot wounds, this was considered an accidental death, open and shut. There's no justice if you're a person of color in the United States because that's all they care about is the industry. This is what they do. This was on, there was little kids that found this, ran on our dumpsters near man camps. This is how they repay us for us letting them come into our communities and destroy them so they can get paid. And so you know what we say? <laughs> We're gonna take back our communities because they're not gonna do it for us. We're going to grab a bullhorn and we're going to go out into our communities and fight back. Because forget that. We're not going to allow them to continue to kill us and take over and just do every crappy thing they can to us. We have to take back in our, our power in our communities because we know no one's going to do it for us. We have to put the pictures out there and tell these semi-truck drivers it's not okay for you to run us over. We have to be the ones that organize against the bomb trains that are going through our communities and killing other people. The police came this day and tried to kick us out of there because we were standing by a train. And we're like, forget you. You're not going to do anything to us. And they didn't. I said, who are you? Where are you from? Iowa? I'm from here. This is my land. You leave. And they did. <laughs> and we have these semi-trucks. Thank you. Thank you. So we're fighting against the semis because they were running us over and killing us. We're fighting against the trains because they were blowing up all over the country. One of them blew up in Canada and killed 47 people. Two of them were kids under the age of five. That came from my community. That greed and that destruction and that death is now going out in these snakes, in semis and in trains. So we fought the semis, we fought the trains. And so they were like, oh. What, what should we do now? Let's have a pipeline. The pipeline is the safest way. Which of course it's not. It's just out of sight, out of mind. And that, you might have heard of the Dakota Access Pipeline. That's what it looks like. That's where it goes from my community. What I was just showing you, just some of the impacts. And that's what it does. This is our land. This is our territory too that was never ceded to the federal government. We never gave up this land. But they say, all you own is this. This is all you own, Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. None of this is yours, even though this is treaty land. And that's exactly right where the pipeline goes through. And the original route was supposed to go right there, just north of Bismarck. Bismarck is a 92% white community. They were like, no, we don't want it. OK, well, we're going to put it right here then, because we're just putting it above a reservation. And so that's why we fought back. That's why we said we have treaty rights, and you can't stomp all over our treaty rights. And so our U.S. government and our U.S. military fought back against us. They had machine guns, they had tanks, they had tons of police from seven states. The Army National Guard came, and we had sweet grass and sage. That was our medicine against them. And, and this next slide is a little graphic, but I want to show it to you because this is what they did to us. They hurt us. You might have heard of Sophia Walensky, who got her arm nearly blown off, who's still undergoing surgeries to try and save her arm. Or Susie, who can no longer see out of her right eye, who went blind because she got shot by a rubber bullet, less than lethal. I mean, the guy that got shot in, near the spine was almost paralyzed. If it had been like a centimeter over, he wouldn't be walking. And we found the weapons they were using. And it says, using at close range or not using in the proper way can lead to death. Because water is life? Because we want to protect water, you're going to do this to us? Well, Standing Rock called out what this country really was built upon, the United States. 
founded upon the raping and pillaging of native lands for capitalism and colonization. And you know what we did? We took our medicine and our feathers and we stood on the front line in front of those police and said, bring it. Because we're not taking it from you anymore. We're going to fight back and stand right in front of you with all your weapons. Because somebody has to stand up for country and protect it. Somebody has to, right? We have a priority <laughs> spitting all over. And you know what? They shut the camp down. They shut that camp down, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they shut that camp down. Like 24 other camps jumped up all over the U.S. There's still camps now that we're fighting back and using our power. It's in our hearts. It's burning right here within us. Like we're going to continue to fight. We don't care about your addiction. The U.S. and other countries are addicted to oil. They're addicted to the fossil fuel industry and they have to be called out. And we're the only ones that can do that. You know, so we might get hurt. Shoot, we might even die. But we're going to die fighting and protecting our country. That's how bad it is because fracking isn't just in my community in the U.S. It's all over the U.S. Fracking isn't just in the U.S. It's all over the freaking world. And it's all of us that are going to be suffering those same detrimental impacts that are happening. This is just my story. Imagine the story of all the others where this is happening or scheduled to happen on top of the coal development and the uranium mining and all the other industry that already exists. Our biggest threat is thinking that it's going to get fixed. Because it's not. We're the ones who are going to stand up and fix it. We're the ones that are going to protect our babies when they say, hey, hey, I go, what do you want to be for Halloween? Oh, mama, um, I'm going to be a bee. Oh, you want to be a bee? Yeah, I protect the bees. Well, what should I be? Mm, mama, you be a flower. Totally innocent. Totally knowing that we have to protect land at four years old. If a four-year-old gets it, why the heck don't they? Yeah. We're working on it. Dr. Michael Yellowbird is from my community. He uses neural decolonization. It's an actual thing. Our brains are pretty dang powerful. And we can use mindfulness to decolonize. If you need to, there's a handbook. Like you can actually go where we have a handbook. This is really specific to our tribal communities. But hey, we're really similar, I've noticed, being over here. Like you can actually go online and download this book and understand what we say when we say decolonization and decolonize your mind. And we have to do it because water is life. It's no coincidence that when we're pregnant, our babies are carried in water. Literally, water is the first life. And there's nothing like that first moment. Literally seconds after they're born when you're like, whoa, I really get it now. Water brought me life. <laughs> I am made of life. We have to have our future power shifters, y'all. We have to show them how to be future power shifters. We're going to do it together. We're going to hit the streets and put our fists up in the air. And we're going to shift the power and change the power and take it back. We're going to do it.